you and I have talked a bunch off the air, uh, and I'll, I'll get to kind of how I feel about the top guys to look at some historic stuff. But go ahead. The floor is yours. No, and I talked about it a little bit on Bill's pod as well. And I think a couple months ago, I declared I was team Chet. And I'm still kind of there. Like, I still would have FOMO if the Magic didn't take Chet and he ended up being good. But I've been watching some, listen, I've been checking tape recently, a lot of YouTube videos. And I know it's like, hey, don't watch the highlight videos, watch the full game. So I've mixed in a little bit of both. Jabari is impressive as hell, man. (laughs) He is impressive. The way that he gets at his spots, obviously he's 6'10", shoots over everybody. I think even his handle has been a little bit underrated. Like, I don't think he's this awesome playmaker. You know, I've seen people, I was actually talking to Sam Bassini a little bit, who we want to get on this pod uh, soon to talk about this a little bit more, about uh, kind of how his, his handle is a little bit un- underrated. And he has like kind of this Tatum vibe to him where he gets his different spots on the floor. And he's probably a better shooter than Tatum, although Tatum's a better playmaker at this point in his career. And that's, the, I guess, maybe the knock on Jabari. But I'm to the point now where I still would go Chet one slightly because of the FOMO aspect, because I think he's just a better all-around player. I mean, the stuff that Chet does, like help defensively, he could dribble, pass, whatever. But I just don't think Chabari's going to miss. Like, he's not going to miss. So you're going to get it. You're getting a guaranteed good player. And, you know, I think he slots. I think both players slot really well into that magic kind of power forward spot. I think Chet would be really good next to Wendell Carter Jr. And I think uh, Jabari would be really good next to Wendell Carter Jr. and Franz. So I'm kind of more... I'm okay with Jabari, even though I'm still probably, I would lean Chet right now. I think this is really hard. I, I imagine, I don't know, I'll have to go back and look at the pre-draft conversations, but I don't, I don't know how difficult it was. Because even with Cade last year and Mobley and Jalen and then even Scotty Barnes, like we're talking a lot of guys everybody liked. When I would check with teams, it was Cade across the board. Yep. And it makes sense, you know, watching this first year and the way the game is played. And you're like, okay, this guy can initiate all these different things and he can shoot and I can run my offense through him. Like, I'm just even, despite what Mobley did as a rookie, which is crazy, you're not really ever giving the ball to Mobley when you need a basket at this point in his career. And that's still, you know, part of the conversation. So when I look at these three guys, it is very hard. And that's why like, I'll probably spend more time on these three than I have at the top for a long time. Because I just, I don't know. I mean, eventually you get to a point where I'm just, not doing enough. Here's here's how I would summarize the three guys. Okay. And this is this is it doesn't really mean anything. It'd be a good radio segment, but this is how I would draft the three guys. If I had nothing in place, I would take Paolo. If I had a bunch of things in place that I already liked, I would take Jabari. And if I was a GM that I knew wasn't I wasn't going to get fired from Sam Presti, I'd take Chet. All right. If I was if I was three or four years into the job and everybody was looking for me, now granted, I would personally take the best player worry about the rest of the stuff that's where you make monumental mistakes where you start drafting for your own survival but you we can't kid ourselves that that doesn't happen a lot in this league and so if you were completely secure i have no problem with team taking chet but if you're like if i get this wrong i'm going to be on espn2 doing 130 raps here wondering if i can (laughs) fill in on wednesday countdown uh that would for some GMs that would factor into it. I still feel like Orlando has a pretty strong structure uh, yeah. down there. I think they're between two and three, the second and third option that you gave. They're the, I think they like the pieces that they have. They need a guy. And I think Weltman is also pretty secure. Like he's not Sam Presti secure, but this isn't a situation where like, I wouldn't take, I wouldn't take Paolo. I just, I wouldn't, um, I, you know, I, actually that's an interesting question too. Like what team do you think if they had the first pick would take Paolo out of like that group of five, six, seven? Because I don't know that there's any team that is completely bare. No, you're right. You're right. With this group, like Orlando thinks they have some guys, uh, and they do. I mean, Franz is awesome. Wendell has turned into kind of, you know, not the peak version of what you'd want him to be, but he got through the rough patches of, oh, no, is this guy going to be this kind of player that shows these glimpses that I really, really like? And they're different glimpses than Bamba. You know, Bamba shows glimpses, but there's too much stuff that I've already seen. Where Wendell... He's a tease player. He's a tease player. Right. That's what he is. You know, to write off Suggs, write off the rest of those guys. And as you've pointed out, Fultz was was good for them. Fultz awesome. is aggressive. And the stuff he was doing when he came back at the end, I'd watch <laughs> and be like, I can't believe how aggressive this is. And this is something else I'm thinking about for next year when we do the over or under preseason or whatever, season preview stuff. Like, one of my things where I ended up having a bad record is because I was like, well, the tanking teams just give me the unders on all of them. All the under teams that I thought were tanking teams, I bet you, I think all of them went over. 
because they all played way harder at the end. So you're right. There doesn't seem to be this team that has literally no one that exists. Okay, so I think that's funny on the Paolo thing because I'm telling you right now, I'm leading Paolo one. Wow. And you have him third. Uh, you can do more with him than any of the other guys. It's not debatable. You can run your offense through him. He was incredibly, like, that team was so stacked. Like, going back and watching Duke games, like I have the last couple of weeks, and I'm talking full Duke games. It's a one-and-done tournament, and they were close to winning the whole thing, so we can't act like it was this. But that talent level on that Duke basketball team was so absurd that that's the five, you know, really like six or seven guys that they had. And Paolo was okay kind of floating in and out of it. I don't think they did a great job. I think they should have let him be more aggressive, but it wasn't going to happen because Wendell's a good player. Um, AJ's really good on the ball, but he had to play kind of a shitty role for him. Roach saved their ass in one of the tournament games. Keels is somebody that was like thought to be a first-round pick when it all comes out. Mark Williams gets better and better every single time you watch him. So there was so much talent on this team that I thought Paolo did a really good job of fitting in with him. And I think he can put it on the floor. He can play make. He can. I know the shooting numbers aren't as good, but I'm not worried about his shot at all. At all. I, I, I think it's. I think it's going to be good because it's very fluid. Um, there's there's nothing weird about it. You know, maybe it's a little loose at times. And then the fact that Paolo, like people are like, oh, he's a little lazy or you know he floats a little i think everybody kind of does you know there's just not a ton of guys that are like totally engaged every single defensive possession and when i watched him i watched the full gonzaga game um from the beginning of the year in vegas i watched that game he had 18 in the first half he was nuts he was so clear and again that's you know chet's developed since then and, and paolo had to leave that game the iv thing so the second half wasn't as good but there was a defensive rebound where he got it and started transition and his his stop to go first gear in transition for a guy at his size was crazy. So even though I watch Chet and I go, think about this. He's amazing off the ball, offense and defense. He was the fourth option a lot of times for that Gonzaga team that had other guys. He understood his, his awareness off the ball is incredible. The <laughs> man you ball thing where he's just constantly looking, constantly looking. Like, okay, where am I positioned? Am I positioned right? His instincts to help when you drive at Chet, the way he kind of backs up and still keeps his hands up to contest drives right at him. Uh, the shooting looks like it's going to be real. The handle's there for somebody his size. It doesn't make a ton of sense. And when Chet makes a mistake, it actually stands out because you're like, wait, Chet made a mistake because he actually doesn't make many mistakes, even if there are little freshman moments. And yes, if you go right at him, with a big guy and try to show like there was a player from Pepperdine that was like, I'm just going to beat you up on this post play. Chet's just not ready for it. He just isn't, you know, physically he's not ready for it. This isn't breaking news for all of it. Um, but I, I'm leaning Paolo here. The more I watch all three guys. And I do think That's, Jabari has, I think Jabari does get into trouble with his dribble. I do. So I, I would, I would disagree with you on that one a little bit. I feel like Jabari I, right I, now is about a two dribble guy. Yeah, all right. I, I would say I, more of more of like I'm impressed at how he gets into his spots. Not necessarily like him like breaking a guy down and kicking out to the corner or something like that. Like he he definitely has a lot of work to do in that department. He doesn't play make, and that that to be honest with you, that worries me. Like if you're going to take a guy one who does not have any playmaking ability right now, who is who is you know you're picking him to be the best player in your team, right? I mean, if it's the first pick in the draft, he should be at least in that conversation. Um, that does that does worry me a little bit, but I still think that the the, the Jabari thing, like he's going to come into the league and in a couple of years be a top five shooter at six foot ten, and I, I don't think, and especially for a Magic team that like needs shooting like that. And then to get back to your Paolo thing, I mean specifically for the Magic and even some of the other teams in the top, you know, top one, two, or three, you know, Orlando Fultz is going to have the ball in his hands. They want to get Franz more involved in the playmaking situation. Um, obviously Suggs is still there as like the sort of like a point guard, two guard hybrid. I don't know that they need a guy like Paolo to do the playmaking stuff. They need they need a guy who can like get you know go to and get him a bucket. Who's going to be good defensively? Like I look at that front court and go, you got Franz, and you got Jabari or Chet, and you got um and you got Wendell Carter Jr. I mean the Franz like Jabari thing like you I get flashbacks to like Hedo and Richard Lewis like a better version of Hedo and Richard Lewis, which obviously gets me excited. Now there's no Dwight on this team, but I think some of the personnel around them could be better. The thing for for Paolo for me though is like if he you know, I don't think he's going to Orlando because I don't think that's the profile of God that they would take. I don't think he's going to OKC because they got like a million playmakers already. Houston does seem like the one team that makes sense. And he's been mocked there every single time. 
Um, and Jalen Green was on Bill Simmons' pod talking about how he wants to up his playmaking ability, but they still need a guy, I think, that could kind of help them do that. Jalen still seems like a straight scorer, you know, slasher, athletic guy. I actually think it'd be a great fit in Houston, even though, like, you know, who knows how that team is actually constructed. My big worry with Paolo the Ryan is, like, the profile of the player. He is, like, who, and I guess this is stupid because maybe, you like, who's Jabari and who's Chet in the NBA? I don't necessarily know. They're, like, kind of a little bit of like unique type players. But if Paulo, if you're saying he's like a better version of Julius Randle or he's like a better version of Blake Griffin, that guy, that guy worries me. That you're a playmaking power forward who's not good defensively. He he usually needs another guy or two to help get the most out of his game. And that would be the thing that scares me about Paulo. Whereas the other two, I think can I think could exist on their own and be totally fine. 